So how do we go about doing, so I'll get used to this click and I'm working in a minute. How do we go about doing that? Um, actually, before I say that, I'll say this is the car in its first race at Lyon in 1924, and that is the design genius that created it in the centre, a very proud Atori Bugatti. So, the parts, how do we go about doing it? Mainly, we actually used plans, um, but there were still lots of areas that weren't, uh, 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 didn't have any plans at all. So, when that occurred, we then went and asked people to take parts off their car, which they kindly did. And this, you know, we kept getting uh, sketches through like that of parts that we could then use to fill in the bits that we didn't know. We also did laser scanning of parts. Um, that was mainly for the body and, uh, well, yeah, many different bits of bodywork. Now, the problem that you've got with drawings when you're reverse engineering something is that they don't tell the whole picture. You've got to think about how the part is going to be manufactured, um, which I'll come to in a second with a, a, a real-world example. So once we'd actually done the drawings, there's, there's a whole heap of work to do, about, to do afterwards. So that is just one part of the car, one of the simpler parts being the front dumb iron. And then you've got to parts like this, which was the engine block, which just took so long to do, it was... It was, it was uh, untold. And the reason is, is that if you can imagine, this is like a typical plan that we got. And although it, it's mostly there, um, quite often there was areas that you couldn't actually see, so you had to go and work it out using different methods. And uh, with the engine block, it was like dimension central. I've never seen so many dimensions of one drawing, and it was a lot less good quality than that. That's for the actual chassis of the vehicle. So... We carried on doing it, and, and in the end, we got down to just a few parts, and this was being one example, the carburettors, where people actually just literally just sent them in, and we just used a tape measure, uh, calipers, verniers, whatever, to go and get it done. And this was actually one of the parts that really uh, sort of made it for me in a daft way, in that I put, I'm a bit of a believer in not keeping projects secret, and the reason for that is, is that you end up with a situation when you finish your project, if you're not careful, that there'll be someone more knowledgeable than you or come along and just basically destroy either all or part of what you've done. Uh, the example always springs to mind is there was a Canadian firm that designed, that spent literally almost a million pounds on doing a Bugatti and they forgot one fundamental thing, which was they picked the wrong chassis. So all this work and it was basically ridiculed which is a real shame because it's a fantastic bit of work apart from that. Um, so anyway, I put this carburetta design on the internet and unbelievably, a guy from Belgium emails me on a Saturday evening and says you've missed out an aspect of this carburetta. And he said there's like a little label that goes on the top. Now, I know this is a really arcane detail, but we were trying to get it right. So I said, okay, brilliant. What does it look like? He goes, well, I've got my Bugatti down in the garage. Give me a few minutes. <laughs> he went down to his garage took the part off, that's his little sketch and uh, picture, and then we could integrate that into the, um, into the design. Uh, hang on a second, yeah, I'll get rid of that. We could integrate that into the design, which we've, which we've done here. So uh, that's the actual carburetor when it was all done with the assembly drawing, etc., and so forth. So that was, when we finished the Bugatti, that's, that's what we sort of ended up with. I've taken a few parts off. You can see the level of detail that we've gone, gone to. Um, one of the most important things was the fit and finish of the vehicle. Um, an example of that is Bugatti wheels. If you look at most Bugattis nowadays, uh, old style ones, they've got polished wheels. That's not how they came from the factory. They came as like a really rough casting. But the trouble is, if we step forward another 30 years, all the people that even vaguely knew about these cars are not going to be around. And the only people that will be around are the ones that have got a vested interest in a car that's, got, that's worth a lot of money being, you know, they, you know, them putting forward it as being the best car. So we spent a lot of time actually making sure the, the, the finish and the way the thing was manufactured was right. To the extent, although this picture's uh, grayscale, the... Um, tubes that cover the, um, uh, the fuel tank, they used to go and chop up oxyacetylene red tube, put it over a metal tube, and that was their um, 
uh, retain, retainer for the, for the uh, fuel tank. And now you're probably wondering, why is there a picture of sheep on the, uh, on the screen? Well, basically, I had a year's money to go and... In fact, it wasn't that. It was about six months' money to go and um, uh, get this project up and running. And it took me five years. I, I literally knew nothing about CAD, nothing about design, nothing about scanning. So it took me a long time. And I had to do that horrible thing called getting a job. And uh, unfortunately, it was like working in a farm. So they look, look actually quite cute there. But, if you like sheep, but my view was actually that uh, because I was having to milk sheep for a living, which is like minimum wage, split shift, start at four o'clock in the morning with these hideous, smelly creatures. It doesn't get any better in real life, believe me. So uh, if there's any interns here that are worried about their lot or thinking, oh, God, I'm earning no money, it could be a lot worse. But uh, <laughs> we, uh, we, got, we got through that stage. And what happened then was I was doing the sheep milking thing because that was it, obviously I was working on the farm milking sheep, doing the sheep milking thing, and my wife came along one Friday afternoon, and normally she's a really placid person, but this day she was absolutely furious. And uh, essentially she was like, look, you know, I'm, I'm a bit sick of being married to a minimum wage sheep milker who smells of farmyard animals, and uh, you're, you're dealing with um, Bugatti frippery that's earning us no money, although I appreciate it looks good. She goes, you've got to go and make this into something. So somewhat reluctantly, I basically picked up a car magazine and rang around a few people. Sorry, emailed a few people, rather. And within a few, again, within a few minutes, a bit like the Bugatti uh, carburetor thing, this gentleman, uh, the gentleman who owns this car, rather, contacted me, and he said, can you come round tomorrow, because I've got a car that needs nipping and tucking? Well, nipping and tucking cars wasn't something I'd really thought of happening. So anyway, I turned up, and it, this car, he'd made it, um, he just started on one corner, a really skilled bloke, started at one corner and just made the shape himself. But he wasn't happy with it, and it was full of filler. So he used it for racing, filler weighs a lot. He wanted a better solution. So the solution that we came up with was this. And essentially, we went from here to here in seven months. That's its first race at Silverstone, seven months after the idea came from his head. The design brief we were given was he literally just gave me 50 pictures of cars he liked, 50 pictures of cars he hated, and said, just make me something that's kind of in the style of that, but doesn't look like anything. I think we did the right thing there because people look at it and they see all kinds of cars, but quite often they'll say it looks like this. Like that car never even was on my radar when it was designed, so we were all right there. So how do we go about it? Well, the first thing was he had a tubular chassis he'd already had made. This is it. And I always remember he wanted, he was so determined for me to go and scan this chassis in. And I just knew that was the wrong, uh, the wrong way forward. So we literally, I said, look, we need the Mark I tape measure. I'll bring a trellis tape. We've, in fact, we've got just a decorating table. Decorating table, went and um, set it up in his garage. Uh, within two days, we'd gone and caddied up the chassis. So if we'd have gone and used a scanner, it would have cost a lot more money, you've got to post-process it, all this kind of thing. And this is kind of like one of my mantras. It doesn't just apply to what I'm doing, but it applies to everything nowadays. It might, this is just my view. And that is, you can't be a one-trick pony. If you're a firm that just does scanning, or if you're a CAD person, you're vulnerable because the way technology is moving, you need to use, what we call it a mash-up method, where we'll be flitting between different... Uh, different types of, um, of method, almost on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. I mean, if we'd have recommended him to, do, to have that scanned, we'd have been, well, basically ripping him off. It, it was not the correct way forward. The correct way forward was to use a basic, traditional method. So, from there, we created a uh, essentially a basic design. These are all his notes on there for what he wanted to go and have changed. And then we, in, in the end, went through five design iterations which are here the first one on the left he didn't like because it was too and quite rightly so it's, it's too modern it's too tvr looking too jag headlights are a more modern design and we gradually worked through until we ended up with the with the end result um, now this guy really knew what he was talking about and he was an absolute pleasure to work with but sometimes with design the customer isn't always right and the one case that always springs to mind is I did this uh, uh, designing this car, 
for this really old uh, boy, Eaton bloke, rower, all that kind of thing. And um, opened up the laptop on his kitchen table and uh, he says, he said, that's rubbish. I can't stand that front wing. You know, this is in a very posh voice, which I can't do. I can't, you know, I don't like that front wing. He goes, can you change it? So I said, oh, okay. So anyway, he said, I've got to go to the loo because I'll be back in a minute. I was thinking, blimey, if you're hoping me to change this in a minute, then we're in, we're in a bit of trouble. So anyway, I literally was just arranging stuff on the desk and thinking how I was going to approach this problem. And he came back and he looked at me and goes, that's fantastic. What have you done? That's exactly what I wanted. So there you go. I went, I, I went along with his second opinion. It saved me a lot of time. So we got the design done. Now, you've got to remember, we're playing at being Gregario, as most of us will be, with the benefit of a budget of about £100. So how can we leverage that, that, uh, that uh, situation? Well, what we did was got a 3D model printed. And now you're probably thinking, well, big deal. Everyone does that nowadays. There's loads of people out there that are doing it. Where one of the things which we think is the, uh, the core, uh, uh, what's good about our company is that we've read loads of books and have got loads of reference material about the way things used to be. And when we did this model, I remembered reading that in the 50s, when people didn't have the benefit of 3D printing, they would go and get a balsa model made of their car, their proposed car, and they'd put it in a box, put a little pinhole in the box, look through, and it had the effect of a pinhole camera scaling up the, the car to more real life uh, look about it. So that's exactly what we did with the 3D model, and it worked brilliantly. And there was an area of the car, which you can't see, but it's just above, it's just, uh, above that uh, side vent. And it wasn't quite right. Um, so that, that method really made what we thought was a good shape into a great shape. So after that, we had to make the tooling for the car, which essentially is a buck. A buck is um, a, a, a former, which body makers use to go and uh, a, a, as a guide to make the body over, the aluminium body. So this one must have been one of my favourite shots of the car on the side. I really love that shape, but I'm biased, obviously. But it's, you can see how the surface model is draped over the eventual tooling. And again, again there. Now, this was one of our earliest bucks that we've done. Some people still use the kind of method that we used then, but we've moved on a pretty fair amount now, and we do it completely different way, which is a lot more, a uh, uh, lot more efficient from the point of view of manufacturing and cost of manufacture, etc. So in effect, that was the Mitchell special and that is the client driving around the, the, uh, the roads of Dorset, uh, enjoying the car even to this day, he's had it about five or six years now and he uses it on a weekly basis. So that's the car design thing. What else can you actually do with this kind of technology? Well, like I said to you before, we, we've got a data bank of um, old books and brochures and manuals. We've got about 10 or 15,000 items. And this is just like one little example. If you're designing something that you want to be old, you need some decent reference material. Um, you can't just come out your own head of design because it tends to come out modern. And the example that always springs to my mind is Vivian Westwood when she designed, the, I'll probably get the designer wrong now, I'm sure it's Vivian Westwood, designed the, um, the clothes for uh, Adam Ant and all that kind of thing. People just see her now as some looking like a bit of a, an old loony, but she spent a lo massive amount of ta time down the V&A Museum getting her reference material nailed so what she designed in modern times worked. So with us, we go and have this bank of data to make sure that what we have is locked in the correct period. This was a, another project we did, which is quite something we do quite often, where the front of the car is always the same. Quite often in the old days, chassis uh, came, basically a manufacturer would supply a chassis, which came up to the bulkhead. And after that, it was free. And this client wanted the uh, after the bulkhead area redone. But the only picture that existed was this one here. Now, a sharp eyed amongst you might notice it hasn't got a door. And that's because the door, cars in those days were so torsionally rubbish. Quite often, they only had a door on one side. So we went from that, scanned in the front of a car, and created the tail end for him. 
you'll see that stuff like the windscreen that we didn't actually need to do, I haven't spent any time at all on making that detail. It's just literally a place marker. Now, this is what I was saying to you about um, when you create parts, it's no, people see CNC as being the uh, be all and end all solution. This is a, if you forgive the pun, a classic example of where it doesn't work if you don't spend some time sorting it out. The part just looks completely incongruous on, on the vehicle. Um, it should have more, you've got to think of the manufacturing process, if it's cast, giving it, or, or stamped, giving it a bit of curve, perhaps a flash line where the parting line, you know, parting line, all these things, and then finishing it off so it looks more like the item of just to the right of it than what it looks like there. It just completely spoils the whole effect, but it does take time to get that done, and you need to have a bit of knowledge of manufacturing. And that's one that we did for a 1915 vehicle. Um, so you can see, it's, you know, there's, a, there's hardly a straight line on it. It's all, all curved. Other things we can do, we've scanned in a couple of 250 GTOs and we were, had the opportunity to compare them. And that was quite a good one because the general conceived opinion is, is that every Ferrari is massively different to the other Ferraris. But we actually found them reasonably close, um, which helps the, the rest, restorer no end. With this one here, this was solving mysteries from the past. Uh, Mid-twenties, all we had to go on was that grainy picture. And the car is that weird design because they were, um, the guy in the twenties, he came up with this idea about ground effect, which generally now is um, thought of as being a Colin Chapman of Lotus idea. So he went and uh, came up with that. And that design, we created um, the basic bodywork for it. And then it, went, it was sent to an engineering magazine who then went and proved that, the, that this guy from the mid-twenties was correct. It did work. Uh, I don't know how they'd steer it or, or whatever. It's uh, not much steering lock on there. You'd have to go to, uh, you know, stick to the motorways. But um, there you go. That was another car we did, just a basic bar Barchetta design. And that's a car that we just sold to a Swiss gentleman, which we just did on spec, which is a monoposto, monoposto style vehicle. Um, with parts, again, when we, you create them, you've got to think of, I keep going back to this point, you've got to think about how they were at the time. So like, this is one of my favourite uh, pieces, in that all the linkage runs, will run through the, um, the central bar. And part of the idea came from an Aston Martin design. And what I liked about that was for the pedals. And what I liked about that was, was that Aston Martin, on their design work, they didn't call them pedals, they called them pads. And I thought that was a much nicer word as opposed to like the way some people drive, you know, hacking away at the steering and bashing the pedals. Perhaps if they're called pads, people drive a little bit, a bit more sensitively, but uh, that's that one. And that was another Aston Martin we did, a uh, replica. And with this one, that we'd redid the whole tail, kept the front end. And again, it's one of those things where when you say it as a sentence, it seems really easy, but it's a bit like if you're trying to create the perfect face, you might say, I don't know, I want Kira Knightley's, I don't know, nose and Michelle Pfeiffer's chin or whatever. But if you mix and match all these things together, it doesn't necessarily follow that they're going to go and work together. So the rear end was done by plans. The front end was done by a scan. But somehow, because, because hand-built vehicles have a variability, trying to get it to all work and blend together was not exactly the work of moments, but it's, it's been good. That's, that's, that was a good project. So I'm almost finishing up now, but I wanted to broaden it to be a bit more than about classic cars. And what brought it home to me about what a massive opportunity, this CAD scan design, you know, the whole situation we're in now, which is what Develop 3D Live's all about, is we were asked to go and demo a scan system up in Scotland. Um, for some reason, Scottish people are into their stones. I don't know why, but this stone, develop, um, this stone depicts a drunken Scottish man, apparently, who's still drinking on a weary horse, in inverted commas, if you look it up on Wikipedia. So that's in the Scottish Museum. And the whole reason they wanted this scanned was that they were going to go and make a mould to make shortbread biscuits to sell in the, in the museum shop. And I thought to myself, blimey, if if someone's made all these different connections to make shortbread moulds from Scottish stones, almost anything, you know, the limit is your imagination. So, 
So there we go. That is the magic about it. And the, w the way I sort of see it is, is that you get companies like Auto, well, any of them, Faro, Autodesk, all the hard, um, SolidWorks, all the hardware and software providers. They're the people that are creating the sort of spells and potions that we use. And what we need to do is, is go and use those to be the best that we can be. So how do you do that? Well, you've got two choices, really. You can just basically turn up at work and... Uh, just get on with what you do without too much enthusiasm, in which case you'll always be the, like the sorcerer's apprentice. Or you can go and actually say, right, that what's new PDF that came through from Autodesk, whatever, I will read that because I might actually learn something. The manuals, we worked it out, and I, tragically, the amount of manuals I'd learned was something like that tool. Now, you can bet your bottom dollar, if you're working for a firm and you read three manuals, you'll know more than most people in your office. If you read five, you'll probably know more than your boss. Tragedy means I don't actually know a lot about, you know, popular culture like Coronation Street or what a Kardashian... Actually, I do know what a Kardashian is. I actually saw, saw Kim Kardashian on the internet and uh, I just realised with a happy, happy Philip that uh, there was someone with a bigger backside on this planet than myself. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah. But I don't know much about popular culture. So you've got, you've got to go and uh, really learn your skill, and it should be something you wake up wanting to do. You have some real enthusiasm for it. And when you've got that enthusiasm, you'll end up creating people like that. And that's what it's all about, whether you're selling, scanning systems, creating cars, doing shortbread biscuit, you know, that's the sort of look we're all after. And that's all I've got to say, really. That is me done. Thank you.